Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. My name is Ron Molinar. I'm the Associate Director for Science in the Division of Global Health Protection, or DGHP, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm also a graduate of the US Epidemic Intelligence Service, what we call EIS, which was the initial field epidemiology training program. So I have a strong affinity, you might even say a passion for FETP. It is a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the second session of the 50th or the 20th FETP International Nights, where FETP residents and graduates share their scientific findings and interact with some of the most brilliant minds in public health. This is the first time the event has been virtual and the first time we've had such a large audience with a thousand people registered. So this is truly a historic event. Thank you all for joining us. And a special thank you to the FETP residents, resident advisors, graduates, mentors, and all the public health experts who took time out of your busy schedules to be here today to hear the presentations. Today's presenters competed for this opportunity and were selected to present and defend their work among their peers and global experts. Much work has gone into these presentations. In the past 18 months, residents and graduates have risen to the challenges of the pandemic time and time again. We're working in unprecedented times and it has stretched us in ways beyond what we could have imagined. But your work, both what you do in the field and your published work, is now more relevant than ever. In my current role, and as a former editor-in-chief of the CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, I know the value of documenting, presenting, and publishing the scientific work you do, and how it informs our knowledge and understanding of public health issues. Public health is an evidence-based endeavor. When we share our scientific work with others in this way, they can look to it as a resource, as they are often going through the same things in their own countries or will in the future. This year, we received 159 abstracts from 40 countries from FETP residents and graduates. The accepted abstracts address the range of public health issues from infectious to non-infectious diseases. And in 2020, residents and graduates also contributed their scientific investigations and understanding through publication of 168 scientific papers and over 50 surveillance reports. So to all the residents and graduates, your work provides the science that guides the implementation of proven health interventions and evidence-based practices. In our Division of Global Health Protection, we're increasingly focusing on what we call implementation science, uh, which could be defined as the study of how best to implement interventions. In addition to characterizing health threats, we want to know what works to prevent and control them. The work of FETP residents and graduates is critical to the health and safety of all of us. We all know how important it is to communicate in plain and simple language as we respond to outbreaks and other public health issues. About five years ago, I invited my mother-in-law, not a scientist, but with an interest in it, to attend FETP International Nights. I wondered if she would like it. She was captivated by the presentations, by their effective use of visuals and the clear logical explanations. After one presentation about a TB outbreak, she commented on what really stood out to her about the presentation. She learned that the people who had been diagnosed with TB and who had been prescribed treatment with directly observed therapy sometimes also just needed a help getting a ride so that they could get their treatment. She quickly appreciated the practical aspects of your work, immediately understanding the important influence of social determinants of health, which drive both the causes and the best solutions to health threats. As I enjoyed the poster presentations yesterday and look forward to the 
oral presentations today, I know that everyone, whether a scientist or not, will also see the tremendous value of your work. We are very fortunate to have our CDC director take time out of her busy schedule to share opening remarks with us today. She can't be with us in person, but she's prepared a video presentation. Before we play the video, allow me the honor of introducing her. Dr. Rochelle Walensky is the 19th director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the ninth administrator of the Agency for Toxic Diseases, Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. She's an influential scholar whose pioneering research has helped advance the national and global response to HIV AIDS. Dr. Walensky is also a well-respected expert on the value of testing and treatment of deadly viruses. Dr. Walensky served as the chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Massachusetts General Hospital from 2017 to 2020 and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School from 2012 to 2020. She served on the front line of the COVID pandemic and conducted research on vaccine delivery and strategies to reach underserved communities. Dr. Walensky is, a, is recognized internationally for her work to improve HIV screening and care in South Africa and nationally recognized for motivating health policy and informing clinical trial design and evaluation in a variety of settings. She is a past chair of the Office of AIDS Research Advisory Council at the National Institutes of Health, chair elect of the HIV Medical Association, and previously served as an advisor to both the World Health Organization and the Joint United Nations Program on HIV AIDS. Originally from Maryland, Dr. Walensky received her Bachelor of Arts from Washington University in St. Louis, her Doctor of Medicine from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, and her Master's in Public Health from the Harvard School of Public Health. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Rochelle Walensky. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you, our friends and partners listening in from across the globe. I'm honored to be here with you for 2021 FETP International Nights. My thanks to each of you, FETP residents, resident advisor, and mentors, for taking time to be here today. CDC is grateful, and I am grateful, for your dedication and commitment to one of the core sciences of public health, epidemiology. Perhaps you have found this to be both an exciting time and a challenging time to be an epidemiologist. These many months of the COVID-19 pandemic have strained public health systems globally, and still you have been driven to find solutions faster than ever before, working tirelessly to protect everyone around you and to give them more than just a fighting chance. The pandemic has devastated the world's economy, disrupted every aspect of our daily lives, and deeply affected families through the loss of loved ones, all effects that will be felt for generations to come. With your support in conducting disease surveillance and response and the vaccines that have been deployed worldwide, we are starting to see a light at the end of this difficult, sad tunnel. Evidence-based decisions and policies must be based on solid epidemiologic investigations, rapid and accurate data collection, thoughtful and thorough data analysis, and the dissemination of those data. It is a complicated process, and you have risen to the challenge of meeting those requirements time and time again during the pandemic. Who knows how many lives have been saved and will be saved through your efforts, and for this we owe you a debt of gratitude. In March and April 2020, 65 field epidemiology training programs were surveyed on how they were participating in the pandemic. Even at that early stage of the world's response to COVID-19, 85% of the field epidemiology training programs reported that their trainees were involved in responding to the global health crisis, and 95% reported that their graduates were also working on the pandemic, all involved in activities such as data collection and analysis, contact tracing, and community education and outreach. This high level of involvement demonstrates your commitment and 
and how much your support was needed in the global response to COVID-19. At the same time, many of you were also responding to concurrent health threats. For example, Guinea's FETP graduates and trainees played leading roles in almost every aspect of the response to the 2021 Ebola outbreak, as well as responding to vaccine-derived polio virus, measles, and yellow fever. Without a well-trained field epidemiology workforce, these outbreaks could have been overwhelming to the country's health system and spread beyond its borders. This is just one example of why the impact and value of FETP cannot be overstated. Complex infectious disease outbreaks like these remind us that more work is needed to strengthen and expand the global field epidemiology workforce through FETP. Support for FETP by host country governments, multilateral organizations, and U.S. government agencies has significantly enhanced global health security by enabling us to work collaboratively and build a global workforce with essential skills in surveillance, data use, and outbreak detection and response. It is wonderful to see that FETP is producing public health leaders who have the training, skills, and experience to manage public health systems systems and safeguard citizens from potential illness and death from health threats. Not surprisingly, many of our FETP graduates have gone on to become effective public health leaders in their respective countries or in global health organizations. For example, before she graduated from the Pakistan Field Epidemiology and Laboratory Training Program in 2019, Dr. Fatima Munaza, a data usage and risk assessment officer in Pakistan's National Stop Transmission of Polio Program, investigated several outbreaks, including measles and extensively drug-resistant typhoid and HIV. On the other side of the world, Dr. Tatiana Lanzieri, the lead epidemiologist for the domestic rubella and cytomegalovirus programs at the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases, graduated with the first cohort of Brazil's FETP. Her investigation on rubella helped Brazil implement surveillance for congenital rubella syndrome in all of its 27 states. And Dr. Dadil Nasia Ndiwaziri, a 2008 graduate of the first cohort of the Nigeria Field Epidemiology and Laboratory Training Program, supported the program by leading the epidemiology, surveillance, and contact tracing efforts of the Ebola response in 2014. She continues her service as the national coordinator of the National Stop Transmission of Polio Program at the African Field Epidemiology Network Office in Nigeria. Each of you will go on to do great things. That is why CDC is committed to working with WHO and other partners to achieve the vision of the Global Field Epidemiology Roadmap and ensure that countries have the applied epidemiology capacity needed to protect the health of their own populations, collaborate with others, and promote global health. As part of this roadmap, the FETP Enterprise Strategic Leadership Group was established this past April to provide guidance and accountability and drive the development, implementation, and evaluation of FETPs. We see this program as essential for all countries' abilities to achieve international health regulations' core capacities and to ensure global health security. So thank you to our long-standing partner, TEFINET, and CDC's Center for Global Health for sponsoring International Nights, and to you for the incredible work you do to keep the world safe. Your vigilance and dedication are crucial to help us fight threats like MERS, Ebola, Zika, and COVID-19. Overcoming adversity is always a challenge, but collectively, we can beat these threats. I wish you the very best for a productive meeting and engaging conversations. Keep up the great work. I appreciate those inspiring opening remarks from our director. I would now like to introduce Dr. David Sugarman, who will be the moderator for the oral presentations today. Dr. Sugarman has a long history with FETP and is currently serving as the resident advisor to Ethiopia's FETP. Prior to his current position, Dr. Sugarman played a key role in CDC's injury prevention work and also served in global vaccine preventable diseases 
for the Global Immunization Division. He's an alumnus of the CDC Epidemic Intelligence, Intelligence Program, where he was assigned to the San Diego County Health Department and CDC Orientation Station there. He graduated from Thomas Jefferson Medical College, completed a Master's of Public Health at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, and his residency in emergency medicine at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Dr. Sugarman serves as editor for several scientific journals and has published over 50 scientific papers. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Sugarman. Thank you, Ron. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, FATP residents, resident advisors, mentors, program directors, coordinators, and friends. It's well known that the oral presentations at TEFINET International Nights represent the very best work in field epidemiology. Today's presenters have competed against residents from 40 programs to make it to this point, now in the running for the prestigious Begie Award for Best Oral Presentation. We have six incredible talks from Central and South Asia, Europe, Africa, and the Americas. Work that has helped the world understand transmission dynamics of COVID-19 and vaccine acceptance as well as classic field detective work, uncovering the causes of an outbreak at a Brazilian jail and another among cattle handlers in Pakistan. Each has pre-recorded their 10-minute presentations, but will be available for a live eight-minute question and answer session. Audience, you can use the Q&A icon in the top right corner of the viewing screen to pose your questions to our presenters. Our first presenter, Rizjan Tobayava from Kazakhstan FETP, will discuss factors associated with an outbreak of COVID-19 in oil field workers, Kazakhstan, June to September, 2020. Good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this conference. I will describe an outbreak investigation of COVID-19 in oil field workers in Kazakhstan that we conducted in June-September 2020. Advance. But first, uh, I would like to give you some general information about my country. Kazakhstan is the largest country in Central Asia and the ninth uh, largest in the world. The population is about 90 million, similar to populations of Romania and Malawi. Oil and gas sector constitutes 44% uh, of annual state budget. As of June 2020, the country had three hotspots of COVID-19 with sporadic cases in other regions. Two largest cities in Kazakhstan um, and Atra region with 13 and 6 COVID-19 cases registered between March and June 2020. This was the third largest hotspot of COVID-19 transmission in the country with an incidence rate of 203 cases per 100,000 populations. Advance. Uh, of these patients, 82% uh, patients are worked at the Tingis Royal Oil and Gas Facility in Tingis. And this is where we conducted our study. Advance. This is a world cloud of potential risk factors in COVID-19 occupational outbreaks. Each world is a risk factor from several occupational studies of COVID. The larger worlds are the most important risk factors. Advance. Tingis Chevrolet introduced COVID-19 mitigation measures for its employees. Here workers are traveling on a bus to their, uh, to their workplace. Uh, interventions are wearing masks and social distancing. Uh, next picture is the cafeteria with red marks on the floor for social distancing and staggered times for meals. This is an epidemic curve uh, of the outbreak. Mitigation started in March, but was unable to control the outbreak. English Chevrolet reduced two thirds of workforce in April and rotated essential works in June. Our field investigation started on July 15 to September 2020. Tingi Chevrolet tested their workers for COVID-19 and percent of workers tested for it. Advance. The objectives of our study were 
to describe the main characteristics of COVID-19 cases by person, place, and time, to identify individual and environmental factors associated with COVID-19 transmission, and to recommend appropriate control measures. Advance. Advance. Uh, we used a concurrent case control study with the incidence density sampling by time and place of rotation work at eight ships camps of Chingishore, with the highest incidence reported since June 2020. Our study population uh, included persons working in these eight selected uh, shift camps on June September 14, 2020. Advance. Advance. Our cases. Uh, where employees of the selected eight shift camps identified as positive for SARS-CoV-2 regardless of signs and symptoms of COVID-19 during the shift work. Two controls per one case patients uh, were randomly selected from the list of SARS-CoV-2 negative employees working or living in the same shift camps during the same shift period as cases. Advance. Our study variables were individual factors, social demographic data, knowledge, beliefs and practice towards COVID-19 mitigation, and environmental factors as working and living conditions. Data were collected by front uh, interviews uh, using structured questionnaire. Clinical and laboratory data were abstracted from a uh, national register of COVID-19 patients. Advance. Uh, we use the chi-square test to determine the difference between proportions. Stratified mental handle analysis to assess for confounding and effect modification across the shift camp strata. Bressler J. Pivalo and the log likelihoods were obtained to test for significant effect modification. Logistic regression analysis was used to generate audacious and 95% confidence intervals. Advanced. And now we are coming to results of our study. Advance. This chart compares the general characteristics of cases and controls in our study. The length of the bar is related to the percentage. Cases and controls have similar general characteristics except for education. Advance. This graph shows current duration. 49% uh, of cases and 31% of controls had less than eight days quarantine. The self-reported quarantine duration ranged from three to 15 days. In Gishevel recommended quarantine their workers for five or 10 days after traveling. The Kazakhstan government recommended a 40-day quarantine. Advance. The symptoms of the 113 case patients were compatible with COVID. Fatigue, uh, loss of appetite, rhinorrhea, and headache. 26% of patients had normal temperature. 56% of case patients were asymptomatic. Advance. Here we examine uh, individual factors associated with COVID 19 transmission stratified by shift camps. The alterations in dark green are significant risk factors, and the alterations in light green are protective factors. All other alterations are not significant. The risk and protective factors differ by shift camp. Uh, for example, the use of fabric masks was protective in Newtingis and a risk factor in Bulashak. Uh, use of two surgical masks per day is a risk factor in two camps and not significant in others. Advance. On this slide, uh, we present environmental factors associated with COVID-19 transmission stratified by shift camps. Environmental factors worried by shift camp, for example, uh, pre-shift quarantine last eight days is a risk factor in Newtingis and protective factor in Shonrak and SK. A conditioner is a risk factor only in one camp. Advance. Our multivariate analysis shows that individual factors were the main determinants of COVID-19 transmission in Tingishvara. Rare or non-use of antiseptics travel prior to coming to rotation, university degree, and social contact out of work hours were the risk factors. Believe that asymptomatic COVID is con contagious, uh, believe that masks protect, and the use of fabric masks were protective factors. Advance. Air conditioner uh, was the only significant environmental risk factor in the multivariable analysis. Advance. Advance. 
Uh, a COVID-19 outbreak occurred among workers in the Tengish Royal facility. Individual factors were the main determinant of COVID-19 transmission in the oil shift camps. Risks were non-use or reuse of antiseptics at work, travel prior to coming to the shift camps, uh, university degree, and social contacts out of work hours events. Among environmental factors, use of air conditioner at the office was the only significant risk factor. The shift camps are disproportionately affected uh, that require targeted prevention measures. Advance. Limitations of our study uh, were multicolonality, individual and environmental risk factors, and workers were hesitant to report symptoms or comorbidities. Advance. Advance. Our recommendations are first uh, to use a multi-layered approach of individual and environmental interventions to control COVID transmission. Each intervention has its holes or drawbacks and only the cumulative success of multiple layers of interventions or slices of cheese can make a difference. Advance. Second, and do not rely on symptom-based screening for COVID-19. Symptom-based screening may not be an effective strategy to quantify an individual's likelihood of having COVID-19. Advance. Third, uh, if unvaccinated, keep consistent quarantine or to a minimum of seven days. Fourth, provide clear and consistent messages regarding mitigation measures like the need for an effectiveness of vaccination of masks. Next. Uh, and finally, improve air disinfection engineering strategies like, uh, the, like mechanical ventilation or domiciled UV air disinfection advance. Uh, in conclusion, the efficacy of the outbreak response and control depends on the speed and scale of environmental or governmental intervention and how individuals receive, perceive, and comply with the provided public health and health risk messages. Advance. 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 Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Reese Chan, for your excellent talk. This presentation is now open for questions. Remember, select the icon in the top right corner of your viewing screen to pose your question. your reference group for the fabric and surgical mask were they being compared to each other or to not wearing a mask Dad, i'm sorry the line was a bit disconnected can you please repeat the question sure sure uh, my question reese john was about the reference for the surgical and fabric masks was it not wearing a mask or were surgical masks being compared to fabric masks and vice versa? Um, do you mean the question about the number of masks used? So it, the comparison was to uh, one mask compared to five or more masks, two masks compared to five masks, and three to four or five masks or more. It's just the comparison, and it was really related to surgical masks. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. We're not seeing any questions yet, so please, audience, uh, think about a question that you'd like, Reese Chan.
Michelle, we're still uh, awaiting questions. I'm wondering if you could let us know about um, updates on vaccine requirements for those working at the oil field and if any have been vaccinated thus far. Жан, пока мы ждем других вопросов, дайте немножечко информации по вакцинации среди медработников. Предлагалась ли вакцинация? Какой статус, когда будет вакцинация? Именно для медработников? Для uh, работников uh, Тенгиш Шевройла. Да, uh, начали вакцинацию. Uh, сейчас где-то около 30 тысяч работников провакцинированы. То есть для них уже есть uh, льготы для мотивации. Uh, они могут uh, заехать на вахту без uh, семидневного предварительного карантина. Mm -hmm. Полная вакцинация. So uh, almost 30,000 uh, oil workers have been vaccinated already at uh, the facility. And uh, for them already, they don't need this pre-rotation quarantine on this, at that point. Thank you. And another question from Kip Baggett. Were there any challenges in implementing the recommendations you had? Рожан, были ли какие-то проблемы в, том, в тот момент, когда вы проводили, давали рекомендации организации вот по мероприятиям контроля для Министерства здравоохранения или же для организации для Тенгиз Ревелла? Любая из пяти рекомендаций. Мы дали рекомендацию, то, что в целом необходим многоуровневый подход к индивидуальным факторам и факторам окружающей среды. То есть как uh, мы представили презентацию в виде модели швейцарского сыра, то есть в каждом uh, вмешательстве есть свои недостатки. И только аккумулятивный подход, uh, он может как-то изменить ситуацию. Какие-то проблемы были с каким-то отдельным из рекомендаций? Как, Какой-то отдельной проблемы? Uh, проблем не было после наших рекомендаций uh, с Представителями Тингиш Шеврел были обсуждены результаты этого исследования, где начали, после чего начали активно вакцинировать с отменой предвахтового карантина и усилили дополнительный инфекционный контроль. Mm -hmm. Спасибо, давайте я переведу. So there was not really a, a big challenges while we were making recommendations. The main recommendation was to keep the multi-layered approach. One of the things that uh, the agency was tracing was vaccination of people. And we had some tensions about the uh, duration of the quarantine, pre-shift quarantine. So with vaccination, that was not an issue anymore. And another question from Carl Reddy. How did these findings impact on policy and practices at other oil field sites? Рыжан, вопрос еще один. Каким образом результаты вашего исследования оказывают влияние на политику и практику в других нефтяных предприятиях, будь то в Казахстане или же за рубежом? Они применимы или нет? А, практика применима, как же помимо тенгизского месторождения, а, тоже на других промышленных объектах а, данные рекомендации были применены, то есть тоже был отменен а, предвахтовый карантин для лиц, которые а, получили а, полный курс вакцинации. А, с усилением также а, коммуникационных а, навыков по улучшению именно инфекционного контроля. Uh, so we believe that uh, the findings uh, will uh, have uh, the impact on policies in any other oil field facility or in many other occupational settings. There are individual and environmental factors that could be influenced if they are really addressed uh, into care there. Could you let us know a little bit more about the limitations of your study? Ржан, об ограничениях исследования можно будет поговорить? Какие у нас были ограничения в исследовании? Можете показать слайд, попросить, наверное. Можно показать слайд, попросить. У нас там просто 18 секунд осталось, давайте я быстро расскажу. У нас было ретроспективное же исследование, поэтому у нас мы зависели от воспоминаний респондентов, и многие... 
Многие из них, они ценили свою работу, и нам на момент опроса они могли, э, не хотели давать негативные ответы, э, так как уже прошли тренинги по COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So one of the limitations that we uh, mentioned in the study was the uh, hesitancy of people to report on symptoms and comorbidities. Uh, people are paid bonuses. This was one. There was the issue with the collinearity. And then the um, collinearity of many variables, uh, individual and environmental. And the last one, this is a case control. It is a concurrent case control study still, uh, which uh, might be, uh, we might have this selection bars, uh, but we try to address it by matching uh, by time of work and shift camp on the workers. Thank you. And for those that were symptomatic, was there access to rapid antigen testing or was it conventional RT-PCR? Рыжан, для симптоматических пациентов у вас было ПЦР тестирование или ЭГД? ПЦР тестирование. ПЦР тестирование. Okay, well, we've come to the end of the eight-minute Q&A. Um, thank you, Рыжан, for your excellent presentation and answers to our questions. Our next presenter, Nayir Nawaz from Pakistan FETP will present risk factors associated with frequent outbreaks of Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever in Sindh province, Pakistan, a case control study. Good morning. This is Dr. Nayir Nawaz, fellow of FLTP 12th cohort, Pakistan. Today, I am presenting my research on risk factor associated with Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever in Sin province, Pakistan, from 2016 to 2020. Advance. Congo is a zoonotic disease with 30% mortality rate in human. It is endemic in Africa, Asia, and some part of Eastern Europe. The virus is transmitted by a tick bite and contact with infected blood or tissue immediately after slaughtering of any infected animal. Human-to-human -human transmission by close contact with infected person is also evident in healthcare setting. Among all infected, 88% of people develop subclinical symptoms and lead severe disease in 13% of the cases. Advance. Pakistan has four provinces with 220 million population. First ever case of CCHF was reported in 1976. Since then, multiple sporadic outbreaks have been reported. Pakistan ranks fourth for highest number of CCHF cases in Asia. The Provincial Disease Surveillance and Response Units are responsible for collecting the information of priority diseases, including CCHF. In 2016, highest number of 104 cases with 19% case fatality rate were reported. Since then, a total of 167 cases were reported during 2017 to 2020. Advance. Our total population of Sindh province is 48 million and comprised of 29 districts. The Karachi is the largest city of Sindh province with 17 million population and six districts. By the virtue of two seaports, it is one of the busiest station for travel and trade and known to be a busiest hub for the country. Because Karachi has the largest livestock market in Asia, so two to three weeks prior to the holy month of Zilhaj, the influx of livestock from all across the country get increased. Advance. This is the pictorial demonstration of livestock movement at international and provincial borders. For the Asia's biggest animal market in Karachi, animals are brought from Afghanistan and from within the country, that is Balochistan, Khyber, Pakhtunkhwa, and Punjab province. Advance. For a purpose of investigation, a case control study was conducted among hospitalized CCHF cases during 2016 to 2020 in Sindh, Pakistan, with the objectives 
to evaluate the associated risk factors and recommend control and preventive measures to halt the ongoing transmission. Advance. A total of 81 CCHF cases were identified and investigated during this study period. For each case, four age and gender matched controls were selected from their neighborhood. A case was defined as a person diagnosed as a CCHF positive PCR and was admitted in tertiary care hospitals of Karachi. Why? A person having no acute febrile illness within during the 14 days before the case patient onset of symptoms was considered as a control. A pre-designed structured questionnaire was used for face-to-face -face interviews for the evaluation of associated risk factors, multivariate logistic regression was applied to calculate odds ratio with 95% confidence interval. Advance. The slide shows that 90% of the cases were men with an attack rate of 3.9 per million and CFR of 35%. Most affected age group was 30 to 39 years with an attack rate of 2.9 per million and case fertility rate 45%. Why? 83% of the cases were from urban settlements with an attack rate of 2.7 per million. Advance. Clinical presentation of CCHF cases shows that among all cases, 100% recorded with a fever sign and more than 80% reported with weakness symptom. Advance. The cumulative numbers from 2016 to 2020 shows year-wise attack rate and case fertility rate. The annual attack rate in year 2019 was higher as compared to rest of the years. Why the case fertility rate has continuously declined except in 2019. Advance. The cumulative number of cases as per Islamic calendar peak started to appear in the month of Zilkada and added, ended in Safar. Peak got high in the month of Zilhaj in which Muslims perform slaughtering of animals. Next. The same pattern is observed from July to September every year due to sacrifice. Advance. This slide shows the comparison of attack rate and case fertility rate among different age groups. As mentioned previously, 30 to 39 years of age is most affected age group, while case fertility rate is high for 50 and above age. Advance. The spatial analysis for the attack rate shows that Karachi has the highest attack rate of more than four per million as compared to other districts. Advance. The comparison of lag time for both live and diseased cases shows that among all diseased cases, lag time from onset to diagnosis is comparatively higher than live cases. Advance. The butchers and livestock handlers had higher odds of getting disease and significantly associated with development of CCHF. Advance. The multivariate analysis reveals that some of the other risk factor, like history of tick bite and contact with confirmed case had a strong association in statistically significant at 95% confidence interval. Advance. We concluded that highest number of cases were reported from Karachi as the biggest livestock market of Asia being held during Eid al-Adha. The middle-aged people are directly involved in the livestock handling and butchering, so they are more exposed and vulnerable. The history of tick bite is also observed among new cases, which shows that the compliance to SOPs, especially use of personal protective equipment for handling and butchering is poor. Advance, infection, prevention, and control measures should be impl implemented in the livestock market, especially during Eid festivals. In addition, 
provision of essential personal protective equipments for animal handlers and monitoring for compliance to standard operating procedures are essential. Use of pesticide spray for livestock before entering in the market and slaughtering with the help of livestock department. There is a dire need to enhance laboratory capacity for early detection and to establish the isolation units in DHQs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nayar, for your excellent presentation. This is now open for questions, and I believe the icon has been successfully dropped onto the viewing screen. While we await our first question coming in, Nayar, could you let us know a little bit more about the requirements for the use of pesticides in Pakistan at these cattle markets? Okay. Hello, do you hear me? Good morning. Yes, we hear you fine. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, unfortunately, we have uh, we have limited uh, tick control activities. Uh, that is not up to the mark due to several reasons. Our livestock department hasn't enough manpower and resources to spray all the animals of farmers who bring them to animal market. In fact, the disease coverage of livestock department in any province of Pakistan is not more than 50% of total population of livestock. So same is the situation with the spraying animals for control of tick-borne diseases like CCHF. There is also a non-standard procedures. Uh, we basically, we use DDT sprays and chlorodan sprays for uh, animals. Can I repeat? No, it's very clear. Thank you. We have okay, a thank question you. that's come in. Contact with a confirmed case was a risk factor for disease. Does this imply that person-to-person -person transmission was occurring? Uh, can you please repeat the question? Sure. You show that contact with a confirmed case was a risk factor for developing disease. Does this imply that person-to-person -person transmission was occurring? Uh, yes, this is implied to person-to-person -to -person transmission of virus. Thank you. Maybe, maybe also in healthcare setting. We're awaiting other questions to come in from our audience. Beyond the use of pesticides, could you further elaborate on some of the challenges with implementing your recommendations? Uh, yes, uh, I suppose, in, especially in rural and urban slums, uh, people usually do not take small disease or mild symptoms seriously. And mostly, if required, they refer to the local GPs, doctors who do not have exposure and means to diagnostic patients, or in some cases are actually quacks. In some areas, faith healers are also considered better than the actual doctors. It is when symptoms are aggravated they re or they reach up to the life-threatening level, patient is referred to tertiary hospitals or care centers. Or due to inadequate human resources or ownership of department, yes, the ownership of livestock department here in Pakistan is a big challenge. Thank you. We have another question. 58% of cases were not butchers or livestock handlers. Any hypothesis as to why, as to what, was their, what were their risk factors? Um, can you please, uh, please repeat again? Sure. 58% of the cases were not butchers or livestock handlers. Do you have any hypotheses as to what were their risk factors? 
those that were not butchers or livestock handlers? How do you feel? Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is maybe okay. due to the tick bite during visit to the uh, livestock market here in Pakistan is a common practice. Uh, uh, for visiting livestock markets, for selecting the animal and catering of the animal at home. People here are actively involved in all activities like slaughtering, making uh, meat and uh, uh, catering. So there is... D David, may I ask a question? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Nayar, listening. Yes. yes Nayar, sir. do pe people come to these markets, select the animals, they walk around the market, select the animals they want, and then do they take them home for slaughtering as well? Yes, this is a common practice here. They take uh, animal to the home and uh, catering the animal and handling the animal and taking care of before the eat. Before 10 to 15 days, here people used to buy animals from the market of their choice. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Can you expand on the temporality of Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever from 2016 to 2020 and why the numbers seem to have increased in 2019? Uh, yes, 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 cases were high. Uh, we found that in 2019, uh, because Asia's biggest cattle market was being held in Karachi, um, market was expanded each year, like from uh, 2000 to two, uh, 2017 to 2019, livestock business were growing. Nearly 500,000 animals were sold for 6 billion Pakistani rupees. That is equal to uh, $35.8 million. Uh, in the Sohrab goat livestock market alone, Karachi. In your study, more males were affected. Was there any difference in symptoms and severity of disease between males and females? Actually, uh, there is a more involvement of men here in Pakistan uh, because uh, this is male dominant society and this is ma men's business, slaughtering and uh, uh, visiting cattle markets and uh, uh, choosing the animal, mostly done by the males here in Pakistan. This is the common practice. And we have a suggestion, instead of spraying the animals, could they walk through a dip tank? It might be a lot quicker. Was that considered? Yes, yes, we consider that too. Did you conduct lab exams among participants and what was the result, especially regarding thrombocytopenia? Uh, can you please repeat again? Did you conduct lab exams amongst the study participants? And if so, what were some of the results? Did any have thrombocytopenia, low platelets? Yeah, it is, yes. Regarding th uh, thrombocytopenia, yes. Did they have any other interesting lab findings? Uh, no, I, I guess no. Um, an important sign of Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever is um, is hemorrhagic signs, but you do not explain in your presentation. Could you tell us the percentage of hemorrhagic signs? And that'll be the last question. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, um, actually, uh, the uh, uh, there is another also uh, symptoms we noticed that uh, uh, um hemorrhages and uh, uh, also um, um, weaknesses, petitial hemorrhages, and Okay, that's, that's fine, Ayar. Excellent job uh, with your presentation and answering the questions. Um, you received so many. Um, thank you. We're going to move to our thank you so much. center.
This is Charlotte Hammer from Epiet and in Finland. She will share her work monitoring COVID-19 vaccine acceptance and reasons for vaccine acceptance, Finland, April to December, 2020. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, I will be presenting the vaccination results of the finished adaptation of the COVID-19 snapshot monitoring. Um, and through that, we have been able between April 2020 and April 2021 to monitor COVID-19 vaccine acceptance, enablers and barriers for vaccine acceptance in Finland. Next slide, please. The aim of this part of the study was to understand vaccine acceptance levels and to identify barriers and enablers for vaccine acceptance and to monitor these over time. Uh, now, this has been happening in the context of the national vaccine rollout um, from early plans sort of in April 2020, uh, and then first vaccinations being administered in December 2020. And by 2021, we had uh, extensive rollout throughout Finland. Um, and at least risk groups and elderly residents had actually been offered vaccination by the time of the last data collection. Now, in terms of the key uh, results, as expected, vaccine acceptance was high, although not quite as high as we normally see here for other vaccines. Um, and both in December 2020 and in April 2021, worry about side effects was the strongest barrier to COVID-19 vaccine acceptance. Uh, and finally, those who had already received a vaccine offer were more inclined to accept or to have accepted the vaccine immediately than those who had not yet received an offer. Now that goes for April 2021. Next slide, please. Um, we conducted five iterative cross-sectional surveys with different uh, randomly selected panels. Now, the first two surveys were conducted in April 2020. A third one followed in May 2021. And in November 2020, we restarted the survey um, after vaccines have kind of become very near um, reality. Um, and then we followed it up with another round in April 2021. Uh, each survey panel was comprised of about 1,000 uh, 1, participants, and those were representative of the Finnish population with regards to age, gender, and major region. The data um, were analyzed descriptively, and we also performed multivariable linear regression modeling to identify key barriers and enablers for vaccine acceptance. Next slide, please. Now, throughout all five iterations of the survey, we monitor self-declared likelihood to accept the COVID-19 vaccine. And this chart shows the five time points. And as you can see, the um, first three iterations, all of which were in spring 2020, had vaccine acceptance levels at round about stable 70%. And then in December 2020, when vaccine nation has become a really realistic option in the very near future, vaccine acceptance actually took a dip and reached an all-time low of 64%. Uh, it was also the only time where we saw double digits in the group that strongly objected to vaccination. However, in April 2021, when the vaccine campaign was in full swing and large portions of the population had already been offered the vaccine, um, it completely reversed. And in the last survey, 74% of the respondents agreed at least somewhat to get vaccinated against COVID-19. Next slide, please. Now, during that survey in April 2021, um, with the vaccine campaign, campaign being in full swing, we also included an additional question uh, regarding the real or expected response to um, a vaccine offer. Now, in green, you can see those reacting favor favorably to an offer. Um, blue shows those unsure uh, or who would like to wait, and red shows those who refuse the vaccine. And the darker color is always representative of those who have already had a vaccine offer, and the lighter color of those who have not yet received an offer. Now, at that point, the vast majority of over 64-year-olds had already received an offer, and the vast majority of this group had also accepted um, the offer, so either having received the vaccine or having made an appointment. In the younger groups, most participants at that point very expectedly had not yet received an offer, but more than half of them were in the favorable reaction group. So that means they had either already received an offer and accepted it, or, or they had the intention to immediately accept after they get an offer. 
And it was only sort of in that youngest age group, so below the age of 30, um, where we had an above 25% large group that um, either preferred to wait or that was not planning on getting the vaccine at all. Now, what was quite remarkable with this is that 24% of those who had not yet received an offer uh, responded that they would like to wait to get the vaccine, even if they got an offer, um, while among those who had already received an offer, that um, went down to 6%. Next slide, please. Um, so then we looked at factors influencing vaccine acceptance and hesitancy. Um, and when doing that, we stratified by age into two groups, um, those aged 65 and above and those younger. Uh, the reason to do that was um, both due to the higher vaccine acceptance in their older group that we had observed, and also due to their risk profile, which made vaccinating this group a priority from a public health point of view. Now, in the older group, we identified four factors that increased likelihood to vaccinate and one that decreased it. Being educated to the level of a polytechnic college uh, was strongest enabler, and that was followed by a minimum of secondary education. However, additional education, such as a university degree, did not further increase the likelihood to vaccinate. Um, if a respondent believed that vaccines in general were safe and effective, they were more likely to also accept the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and the same applied if they were particularly worried about severe disease from COVID-19. The only barrier we could identify was worry about uh, side effects of the vaccine. Next slide, please. In the younger age group, we again identified four factors that increased vaccine acceptance and then two that decreased it. Um, the strongest factor being being above 60, so the, the oldest five years in that, um, in that stratum. Um, and then again, those who believe vaccines given in Finland are generally safe and effective were more likely to accept the vaccine. Um, also, those who were particularly interested in their own pr protection were more likely to get vaccinated. And again, like with the older group, uh, those particularly concerned about severe disease. Um, barriers to vaccine acceptance in this younger group were, again, worry about side effects, so that's the same. And um, additionally, there was also in this group a small minority that believed that COVID-19 was a man-made bioweapon, which did not agree to get vaccinated. Next slide, please. Now, overall, we see moderately high to very high COVID-19 vaccine acceptance in Finland. Um, however, this acceptance in this context is lower than what we normally see in Finland for other vaccines. Now, considering this, together with the strong role of possible side effects in uh, preventing vaccine acceptance, has led us to the conclusion that additional communication and information is needed regarding specifically the COVID-19 vaccines available in Finland, um, and particularly regarding sort of the safety protocol and also regarding the short uh, time frame for development of the vaccines, which um, has concerned some um, respondents. Now, the, regarding the group that would like to wait, um, that is the, the group that we would like to be able to address better. Um, we're currently lacking enough data to determine the reason for this discrepancy between those who have already received a vaccine offer and those who have not. Uh, however, we can conceive two possible different reasons for that. The first being um, that a hypothetical offer is like, less likely to be accepted than a real one. And that would actually be in line with uh, the difference in vaccine acceptance between December 2020 and April 2021. And second, uh, that vaccine offers are strongly age dependent, um, oldest being offered first. Um, and uh, the older generation is also more inclined to accept vaccination immediately. So there's a, a clear correlation there as well. Um, but it, overall, we aim to keep monitoring the developments with this group. And we strongly suggest additional qualitative study to understand the reasons for waiting rather than accepting the vaccine immediately. Next slide, please. Now, on behalf of the entire research team, I would like to thank all our supporters and collaborators, and particularly the COSMO team who developed the standard protocol which we adapted for Finland. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Charlotte. And I believe everyone should now be seeing the Q&A box to the right of your screen. If not, please refresh and see if it's appearing. 
Charlotte, um, I'm going to start with the first question around why you think there may have been lower acceptance right before vaccine became available in Finland. Um, might you have any thoughts about that? Um, I mean, I can't say anything definitive from the data we have, um, but what we have been uh, hypothesizing is that it is quite different to ask about vaccination, um, whether you ask a hypothetical question, were this a real question, and that that changes sort of over the course of it. So when we looked at the very early stages, say April 2020, it was very much on the very far horizon. No one knew when it would be, um, as the, especially among the general public. I mean, even among professionals, we didn't quite know the time frame for this. Um, so it was very easy to say, yes, I will accept it immediately. Um, but then by December 2020, we had a lot more information. It was clear that vaccines would become available for the first group people within the months. Um, which we believe has kind of dampened down that a little bit and made people a little more, bit more careful. However, then when we look at April 2020, 2021, sorry, um, when we had a very real vaccination situation um, where it was very clear that there was a timeline for everyone to be offered a vaccine within the next couple of weeks and months, um, the, the picture then changes again. So I believe without actually being able to substantiate it at this point, that that plays a role. But um, we have planned qualitative studies to look further into this. Excellent, thank you. And our next question is from Carl Reddy. Were there any differences in vaccine acceptance in the rural semi, semi population? That's a really, really interesting question that I'm personally very interested in um, that we unfortunately could not address. Um, so one of the main limitations of this study is that it was um, a sort of traditional market research panel that we were looking at. So you have a very distinct population, uh, even though they are representative of the population in terms of age, major region and um, gender, you do have a, a slant towards people who are more digitally adapt. You have a slant towards people um, what we've seen in our data, who are able to work from home. Uh, so we had a much higher proportion of those than would normally be expected. Um, and the Sami population would not be represented within that. Um, I would expect that the situation there is quite different. And I am unfortunately not able to comment on what exactly the situation there is and will be in the future. Because obviously in, in that context, the logistics and also the politics are also quite complex. So the Sami people um, are a nomadic group. So they, they are the last indigenous group in Europe and they travel between Finland, Sweden and Norway. Um, and actually I believe this question would probably be best addressed to my colleagues in Norway because considering that while it is a nomadic population, they do have a seat of government and that is in Kautokai in northern Norway. Okay, our next question is around your age groupings. Um, the questioner is wondering if greater than 65 is too large versus less than 65, um, and did you consider smaller age bands? Um, and then also, did you um, look into AEFI and did, did adverse events following immunization um, have any impact on acceptance of vaccine? Okay, um, I'll take those two in turn. Um, so regarding the age bands, uh, we did consider smaller age bands, but we also looked at how um, acceptance changed across age bands. And um, the among uh, the above 65 year old group was fairly homogenous in their answers um, and also not the largest group. So we try to keep the groups relatively evenly sized and uh, for kind of analysis reasons. And that's why they were grouped the way they were. Now, regarding the second question with adverse events, um, it would have been a really interesting thing and you would have expected it kind of to, to play a role, especially considering that we asked our last group um, in April 2021, so right after we had a lot of controversy around the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine across Europe, but particularly also in Finland. Um, but in fact, we did not see that in the data at all. Um, so you would have expected to worry about uh, adverse events to go up. You would have expected maybe um, vaccine acceptance to go down, but exactly the opposite was in fact the case. So clearly among the Finnish population, at least, uh, this did not play a large role. 
Our next question were, were the same group of 1,000 persons queried at each round? How were potential respondents queried or selected? All right. Uh, no, those were five distinct panels, so five times with different people. Um, they were made up of a variety of pre-existing panels um, because we, we exhausted the, the pre-existing panel. So Finland is a very small country. Our existing panels are fairly small as well. Um, so by the end of the study, we were drawing on four different panels that um, the, the company we were working with had access to. Um, so they, they were selected from those panels, which are um, in, in and of themselves a representative of the Finnish population. You mentioned that there's a higher acceptance rate for other vaccines. What is the acceptance rate for childhood vaccines in Finland? Um, the acceptance rate for childhood vaccination is in the high 90%, um, so quite significantly higher from even the, the highest we've seen for, for COVID-19. Um, but obviously there we, we have a slightly different dynamic. We're looking at childhood vaccination, whereas here we're looking mainly at adult vaccination. Um, vaccination rates for influenza, which are maybe a little bit closer in terms of comparison are lower, um, but we don't have like a nationwide rate there um, readily available. But among healthcare workers, at least that rate is also now above 90%. How do you relate the belief about COVID-19 being man-made with the cause of refusal to vaccinate in society? Um, now, first of all, a, a bit of a disclaimer here, this is a tiny, tiny group. Um, although it did come out stat statistically significant. Um, I mean, you could speculate that this is a group that believes that pretty much every information being put out by official sources is more or less made up. Um, so that would very neatly explain a hesitancy towards vaccination. Um, but it is a very difficult group to study. They are not necessarily the people most likely to take part in a study like this. So I'm actually very glad that these people actually answered our questions. They are not the most likely to take part in our um, additional qualitative studies as well. So it's very difficult to actually distill what the mechanism there is. Okay, while we're waiting for additional questions to come into the chat, um, I was wondering if you looked at different vaccines or if this was all related to AstraZeneca, did, did you consider acceptance around J&J or other vaccines that may have been available in Finland? Okay, um, so for, obviously this is only for like April 2021 because before that it was it was all high, highly hypothetical. Um, but Finland has access to AstraZeneca and Pfizer um, with the majority of the population being offered Pfizer. Um, and then we had some controversy in that regard, especially with AstraZeneca um, being initially, as with across Europe, offered to those below 65 and then now offered above 60 with the, the issues um, coming out regarding side effects. So there has certainly been some concerns in that area, uh, but not massively impacting the ro rollout. Thank you so much, Charlotte. We're at time. Excellent uh, presentation and work on the question and answers. Thank you. All right, we're gonna be moving to our fourth presenter. Oliver Moeso will share his talk, Prevalence of Suspected SARS-CoV-2 Reinfection Among the Zambian Population, Zambia 2020 to 2021. Greetings, my name is Oliver Moeso, a field epidemiology trainee resident in Zambia. I will share with you today a study on the prevalence of suspected SARS-CoV-2 reinfection in Zambia over the period of March 2020 to June 2021. Let us begin. Next slide, please. Zambia, like most other countries in the world, has not been spared from the COVID-19 pandemic. We continue to experience an upward trend of new and repeat infections and mortality. Over 160,000 confirmed cases have been seen through to 5th July 2021 with just over 2,000 deaths. Zambia has experienced three waves so far, as shown in the graph on the right. There are likely more infections than have been reported in Zambia. For example, a study done showed that during wave one, only 1% 1 of infections were confirmed. Next slide. Variants of concern have been detected in the three waves experienced in Zambia so far. The wild type variant in wave one, the beta variant in wave two defect, detected by genomic sequencing, 
as shown in the graph on the right, and possibly the Delta variant in wave three. The diagram confirms the trend that is very similar to that seen in South Africa. Sequencing data beyond February is currently not available for Zambia, but at least one case of Delta has been detected. The risk of reinfection may be linked to the variant circulating. Lab investigations have demonstrated reduction in antibody neutralizing activity against both beta and delta, and some loss of vaccine effectiveness has been observed for both variants. Mutations that lead to immune escape from pre-existing immunity could increase risk of infection. Because we don't understand immunity against long-term SARS-CoV-2, it is important to study reinfection and the variants linked to it. Next slide. Objectives were threefold. To investigate the prevalence of suspected SARS-CoV-2 reinfection in Zambia, to identify demographic factors associated with SARS-CoV-2 reinfection, to make recommendations to better understand SARS-CoV-2 reinfection in Zambia. Next slide. Data source for our study was from data, the database of positive SARS-CoV-2 test results maintained by the Zambia National Public Health Institute. A positive PCR or RDT indicated SARS-CoV-2 infection. This line list ran from the 18th of March, 2020 to the 12th of June, 2021. SARS-CoV-2 reinfection was identified by an individual having more than one positive SARS-CoV-2 test result. We matched individuals by age, sex, and name. Names were matched using the Jarrow Winkler score, a tool developed by the US Census Bureau to match individuals across data sets. It measures distance between string sequences such as names. Based on deletions, additions, substitutions, and transposition, we use the threshold of less than 0.1, which is what is used by the US Census Bureau. Two independent raters then manually reviewed potential matches with a third acting to resolve the disagreements. Next slide. A bit more on the Jarrow Winkler string distance. The lower the score, the closer the match. A score of zero is an exact match, while a score of one shows no matching. We set our threshold to less than 0.1. A demonstration of what is meant by insertion, deletion, substitution, and transposition is shown in the slide. Based on the threshold chosen, the Jarrow Winkler would determine inclusion or exclusion of two names as matches. The formula on the right demonstrates how a Jarrow Winkler score is arrived at based on the following. The number of matching characters, transpositions, characters in string one and characters in string two. Next slide. Suffice to say, there's no agreed upon case definition for SARS-CoV-2 infection. Once we get to our line list of potential matches, we apply this criteria that was adapted from CDC. Suspected cases could either be likely or possible. A likely suspected case is a person with SARS-CoV-2 detected more than or equal to 90 days since first SARS-CoV-2 infection. A possible case is a person with SARS-CoV-2 detected 45 to 89 days since first SARS-CoV-2 infection. A confirmed case is a person with more than or equal to two SARS-CoV-2 positive tests showing distinct phylogenetic strains by genomic sequencing. Next slide. We calculated prevalence of reinfection and 95% confidence intervals. We analyzed data by age, sex, and time. We defined time by an epidemic wave in Zambia. As shown earlier, each wave had a defined different dominant strain. In wave one, the dominant strain was the wild type. In wave two, the dominant strain was the beta variant. And in wave three, the likely dominant strain is the delta variant. Wave three is depicted as ending on the 12th of June, 2021, as that is the end date of data collection for the analysis. However, the third wave is currently ongoing. The analysis were performed in R, and the package used for the Jarrow Winkler score was string disk. Next slide. Out of approximately 93,000 records, 272 suspected reinfections were identified, 211 likely, and 61 possible. The flowchart on the right depicts this and gives a breakdown from the positives database to the final suspect reinfections. Our first objective was to inv investigate prevalence. A prevalence of 0.29% at 95% confidence intervals of 0.2 to 0.38 was found. This corresponded to 272 suspect reinfections. 
The median time to infection was 149 days. No suspected reinfections were confirmed by genomic sequencing. Next slide. Variations of number of persons reinfected and having first infections among different age group bands was significant. Highest cases of reinfection relative to first cases were seen in the 30 to 49 age group band. Cases of reinfection were seen to increase with increasing age group until age 50. Sex distribution among persons reinfected against first time infections was relatively the same and was not significant. The number of persons reinfected was seen to increase as well as first infections with forthcoming subsequent waves. Wave two had higher proportion of reinfections than wave one. And with only less than a month into wave three at the time of the analysis, the proportion of reinfection was 68% of that seen in wave two. Be reminded that wave three is still ongoing. Next slide. The reporting of SARS-CoV-2 infection evidence from estimates in the country saved a profound limitation in this study. The number of missing variables affected the sample size. Potential for non-random misclassif misclassification using the Jaro Winkler score that may introduce error. Key information about cases like clinical status, reason for testing or retesting, and vaccination status is not consistently captured in the data set. The ongoing third wave in Zambia coupled with likelihood of reinfection increasing with time limited the estimate of prevalence. The lack of genomic sequencing in the study limited us from the use of the confirmed case definition for the reinfections identified in the study. Next slide. Persons with suspected SARS-CoV-2 reinfection were identified in Zambia. These estimates are within context with other studies done in the US, Denmark, Qatar, Italy. With increasing age group bands, cases of reinfection were seen to increase until age 50. Persons 15 to 49 years old had higher reinfection prevalence. These persons at this age band could potentially have greater exposure to SARS-CoV-2. There was an expected increase in cases of reinfection through subsequent waves one, two, three, as it's time dependent. Next slide. After investigating the prevalence and identifying the demographic factors associated with SARS-CoV-2 reinfection in Zambia, the following recommendations were made. To continue surveillance for SARS-CoV-2 reinfection within routinely collected data, knowing that genomic sequencing is available in Zambia will enable confirmation of reinfection through phylogenetic strains. Most importantly, to establish ability to rapidly identify suspected reinfections and confirm with sequencing. This in turn will enrich understanding of long-term immunity to various strains. To sell, scale up COVID-19 vaccinations, which will reduce risk of reinfection with different strains. The COVID-19 pandemic is being experienced in Zambia. Our resolve to champion the fight against it as field epidemiologists remains strong and unwavered. I thank you for your time and the opportunity. Good day. Oliver, thank you for quite an articulate presentation. Our first question comes from Kip Baggett. Um, no reinfections were confirmed by sequencing, but how many of the cases had isolates sequenced? Thank you for the question. Am I audible? You are, we can hear you fine. Thanks. Uh, none of the isolates were actually sequenced by genomic sequencing in, the, in this study. It was not one of the variables that we were actually looking at. And I was wondering if you looked at clinical outcomes of primary infection versus reinfection. Was that something that you looked at? We, we did not um, look at the, the outcomes. Uh, the data set that we were using was, was not uh, uh, covering the, the clinical variables. So we, we were unable to actually um, look at the clinical outcomes. CDC recommends against retesting in the 90 days following a positive RT-PCR 
unless there is a clinical indication for retesting? Would it be possible to report on the clinical indications for retesting and analysis of likely versus suspected separately? Could you please uh, repeat the question? Sure, happy to. CDC recommends against retesting in the 90 days following a positive RT-PCR unless there is a clinical indication for retesting. Would it be possible to report on the clinical indications for retesting and analysis of likely versus suspected separately? Yes, uh, it's true CDC uh, actually does not uh, recommend uh, testing uh, uh, prior to 90 days for reinfection, but they, they, there are some instances in which uh, recommendation has been made where if, if, the, if the individual probably is symptomatic at the, at the time of testing, that's before 90 days, or if they have an epidemiological link uh, the, you could possibly still uh, test them within the, uh, less than uh, 90 days. Um, so it is possible to, to do a further analysis that would actually look at, uh, at uh, the clinical uh, variables and uh, the reason for retesting in less than 45 days. I think that's an analysis that we might, we might actually look at in, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. You indicated loss of vaccine effectiveness against beta and delta variant in slide four. Where was this observed and for which specific vaccines, Pfizer, J&J, et cetera? Thank you. Uh, those were studies that were done uh, outside the country and uh, not in Zambia. So that was just a uh, uh, kind of uh, citation that was taken from, from other studies. And uh, that loss of vaccine effectiveness was seen with uh, other vaccines than the AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca was seen to still have uh, uh, a good uh, vaccine effectiveness uh, um, across all forms of uh, variants without much loss of, of, of effectiveness. Thank you. We have another question about the vaccine coverage right now in Zambia. What's the current COVID-19 vaccine coverage rate? Um, I'm unable to actually give the exact vaccine coverage uh, for, for the for COVID-19 at the moment, but I would be able to actually give that uh, response uh, afterwards. Sure. We have another question. If confirmation of reinfection is not done, how reliable are your findings? Uh, our findings are reliable because uh, this is a, an, an adaptation from uh, the CDC guidelines, which actually uh, have a preserve for doing, uh, 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 coming up with a, a reinfection uh, definition in, in, in a setting where you cannot, you cannot actually do uh, genomic sequencing. So from the adapted CD guide, CDC guidelines, it's, it's actually possible to um, uh, come up with uh, reinfection case definitions based on, on high index of suspicion rather than just uh, relying on confirmed uh, genomic sequencing alone. What was the most significant risk factor for this reinfection episode? Uh, the, the most uh, significant risk factor as could be aligned to the high prevalence in the, in the 
15 to 49 age group, which is the most productive, uh, was seen to be that people would people in this age group would be most would be the most uh, uh, ones who would be outside in the outside environment trying to probably make a living. So they would not adhere to the to what we call here in Zambia as the five golden rules, where they would just go out in, and mingle, be be in bars and still socialize despite uh, uh, the, the guidelines that have been put forth. So the productive age group and they are, the, the, them being um, able to go out and socialize more uh, kind of uh, contributed more to them having higher cases of reinfection. Based on your prior response, I don't know if you're going to know this, but um, do you know the case fatality rate for the reinfected? And also, as you've mentioned, the 15 to 49 are at the highest risk of, of reinfection. How have they been prioritized in the vaccine rollout? And most countries are not prioritizing this group. Um, how is reinfection influencing your vaccine strategy? Yes, uh, with regards, I think I'll, I'll start with the last question. Uh, with regards to prioritizing the 15 to 49 age group, that is based on uh, uh, logistics at the moment because uh, the priority that, that was done uh, considering um, the people with the highest rate of, of transmission and also possible infection was seen in the healthcare workers. So these were the first people that were actually um, had had private to, to the vaccines that were first rolled out. And uh, possibly we could be able to influence uh, policy with uh, this uh, a study that we've done by prioritizing the 15 to 49 age group. So I hope with these findings, we can be able to um, prioritize this age group with the new batch of vaccines that we, we have received. Thank you so much, Oliver. We're at time. Uh, appreciate your excellent presentation and a great job with the question and answer session. Our next presenter is coming from Brazil's FETP, Laís Ralvas. We'll discuss a beriberi outbreak investigation among male prisoners in a state public jail, Brazil, 2020. Good morning. Next, please. Next slide. On May 6, 2020, one Brazilian state health department was notified of an outbreak with anaerobiology in a public jail. Sick inmates presented paresthesia, difficult walking, edema, chains in blood pressure, and vomit. The department started a response, including reinforcing clinical evaluation and collection of some samples, and called Brazilian Minister of Health for epidemiological investigation. FTP arrived on June 15. At that moment, raised initial hypotheses included leptospirosis, water foodborne disease, and intoxication. Next slide. We designed this investigation to confirm and describe the outbreak, identify the etiology and risk factors, and recommend control measures. Next. We performed a case series of all inmates who had received healthcare assistance because of that un unknown disease and an environmental investigation to identify possible exposure events. Next. Study location was a new open public, public jail in Northeast region of Brazil. Next. Data sources were a line list provided by jail's health team, medical charts, some available laboratory results, and offshore documents. And we used descriptive statistics. Next, next. Jail's health team identified 262 cases, representing 40% of inmates. They had a median age of 20 years. Next. Paresthesia, edema, and numbness were the most frequent symptoms. Next. 
Most cases began to manifest symptoms between late April and late May, and when we arrived, the curve had already dropped. Next. Leptospirosis, one of initial hypotheses, was confirmed only in untested inmates. Next. Furthermore, in environmental investigation, we've identified the occurrence of numerous floods, a breaking water pump, and actions of sanitization and vectors controls. Next. This event supported initial hypothesis, but temporality wasn't plausible with incubation periods. Next. On the other hand, we found a menu with very low diversity, 15 hours between dinner and breakfast, and a diet rich in simple carbohydrates, with every lunch and dinner consisting of about 8% of white rice. And we also identified that prior to COVID pandemic, inmates' families were able to send them up to 15 fruits every fortnight. Next. But this supply was interrupted on May 15th, and we've also identified that there was a change in jail's direction for a period. Next. So what could have caused the outbreak? Next. We included beriberi hypothesis, which is a disease caused by thiamine nutritional deficiency. It's a water-soluble water -soluble vitamin of B complex that is not synthesized by human body. So it's acquired by diet and rapidly secreted. It plays an important role in electrical impulse and in its absence, three manifestations are described, dry, wet, and gastrointestinal beriberi. Only isolated outbreaks were registered in the last years in restricted communities. Next. We applied a suspected case definition considering at least one expected symptom of dry or wet beriberi or at least two of gastrointestinal beriberi. Next. We also performed a case control study considering for case at least three symptoms of any beriberi manifestation. For controls, we performed a stratified and systematic sampling enrolling inmates who have not been identified with the unknown disease. Next. Inmates were interviewed through a standard questionnaire, and we presented odds rate to identify factors associated with illness by logistic regression. epi and R softwares were used. Next. 77% 77% of unknown disease cases met beriberi suspected definition, among which 50% had the three beriberi manifestations, 32% had two, and 18% one of them. Next. 68 suspected cases were selected for case control study, among which 35 were interviewed. Next. From other inmates, 108 were sampled and 54 interviewed, achieving a ratio of 1.5 control for each case. Next. 56 beriberi suspected cases were hospitalized. Thiamine or B-complex administration were identified in 24 charts and among them most recovered and six died. Next, 84% of inmates reported menu changes after outbreak began, and when asked which change the word cloud identified the main terms fruit, salad, period, beef, and chicken. Next, in simple logistic regression, we didn't find significant association between illness and race, disability, underlying condition, Marital status, next. Nor with drug use before arrest. To be classified, receive external visit or fasting, next. On the other hand, we found a significant association between illness and schooling level, physical exercise, next. 
and also with detention time and family's food supply. Next. After adjustment and multiple regression, case have 5.1 times the chance of being arrested for six months or more, and 0.3 times the chance of reporting physical exercise when compared to controls. Next. One more slide, please. We concluded that hypovitaminose was outbreaks probable etiology due to exposure to poor nutrition and food monotony for long periods, which is consistent with clinical and epidemiological findings. However, thiamine dosage nor therapeutic, therapeutic testing were possible to confirm case as recommended by clinical protocols. The greater chance of Exercise among control may reflect better health status, while longer detention time between cases may reflect time to exposure to low nutrient diet in jails as a risk factor. Next. The increase and decline in case curve may have been related to interruption in family's food supply and change in menu during jails direction chain period. They may have provided a brief thiamine replacement. And considering these findings, we'd like to highlight that health eating every day is a basic human right guarantee in Brazilian constitution as a state responsibility. Our results aim at vulnerability and food insecurity, leading to serious illness and death that could have been preventable. Next. We recommended thiamine administration for all inmates in state public jail, continuous clinical evaluation to monitor prognostic improvement, to confirm very, very case and to guarantee rehabilitation when necessary, and adversification on menu, including rich thiamine and other vitamins food. Next. After investigation, updated information about state follow-up showed us that thiamine was administrated to all inmates at jail and there were no new cases. Next. Thank you a lot. Thank you so much, Laís. We have a few questions coming into the chat. Um, the first is, what is period food change? Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your question. We've seen some menu changes as was re related for by the inmates and they reported some uh, difference in offering them salads and fruits and a better cooked alimentation. Thank you, Lais. I saw that initially beriberi wasn't included in your differential. What led you to considering this? Was it a physician that saw one of the prisoners at a clinic or, or something else? Thanks for your question, David. Uh, this hypothesis has raised after several rounds of discussion with clinicians but the hypothesis was included by FTP team and we had already have had three investigations of beriberi in our history. And we also had another investigation of hypovitaminosis uh, at the same year, last, in, in the last year. So we suspected uh, after removal of the initial hypothesis and included this new hypothesis. Excellent. Um, since, case, since case counts had begun to drop by the arrival of the FETP team, what measures had been implemented before FETP arrival? Before our arrive, arrival uh, to start our field work, they had uh, 
Some actions like reinforcing clinical evaluation, they also had collected water samples uh, at jail in two moments to test if uh, there was a uh, pathogen at uh, water as a vehicle, and also some samples from inmates, from blood samples from inmates to also test some agents. Uh, but uh, for thiamine dosage, it was after our recommendation and it happened during the field work, not after our uh, work. And uh, we also realized that there was that change in the menu I have also answered. Thank you, Laís. Was there any follow-up done to confirm the etiology? Follow-up lab testing, I believe, is what the questioner is asking. Yes, it states uh, as a state responsibility, not from our responsibility in Minister of Health. We recommended the follow-up and also uh, the administration and maybe if it's necessary, the reinforcing rehabilitation, but these actions were took by the State Department and Ministry of Health and FTP has uh, monitored the outbreak. And I think that you partially uh, addressed this already, but um... Are there other outbreaks in prisons in Brazil linked to poor nutrition? You mentioned other out outbreak investigations around hypovitaminosis, but uh, in general, uh, others linked to poor nutrition in prisons. You may imagine it wasn't uh, an easy investigation. It has learned us much more than epidemiology. And it was also an opportunity to uh, learn the, all the steps of an investigation. And it also learned us a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, the power of uh, descriptive studies. Because when we arrived, there were lots of uh, hypotheses and all of them was, were removed with uh, just a histogram, just a plausibility and temporality criteria. So it was such an import, important uh, experience in our professional and in our personal life to have this investigation inside the jail with this vulnerability situation that we found. Thanks for your question. Yes. Did any of the cases have a history of alcohol abuse before imprisonment? Could you please repeat, please? Yes, did any of the prisoners have a history of alcohol abuse before imprisonment? I, I know that you looked at alcohol and drug use as a risk factor. Um, was that prior to imprisonment? We believe it could have happened, but we didn't find this uh, information because uh, they had a um, median age uh, arrest uh, they had been arrested for a median age of two months or more. I don't have the precisely number. And before this, some of them has reported that they use it in a booth, but inside jail, it wasn't allowed. Thank you. You mentioned that thiamine testing wasn't possible, but what about for the hospitalized patients treated with thiamine? Was testing done there? Thank you for your question. In Brazil, the thiamine dosage isn't in, uh, pub, in our public system. It's a difficult test uh, and uh, the clinical protocol recommend the administration of thiamine as a test proof 
uh, which means if you take the vitamin and you, how can I say get better? And you, if you get better, uh, so you can confirm the case. So no, for hospitalized persons, they also haven't hadn't the opportunity to have thiamine dosage. The next questioner congratulates you on a very good epi investigation. Um, the questioner asks, there might, um, you mentioned that there might be supplements provided by the jail authorities, which may have reduced the cases. Um, is there any information available on what was given or what changes in food menu was done? Our, our finds uh, showed us that they depended on their family supply for having a health eating. So but what standard was the supply that was up to 15 fr fruits and the changes in menu was the same uh, answered before, like salads uh, and fruits or a very cooked meal. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Excellent job presenting um, in English. Very well done, um, both presentation and your Q&A. Congratulations. Um, our next presenter, our last presenter, is Anna Youssef from the Epidemic. Good morning. My name is Anna Youssef, and I am an Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Today, I will be presenting a study evaluating transmission of SARS-CoV-2 virus from children and adolescents with lab-confirmed infection to their contacts in the household setting. Next slide. In July 2020, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, in collaboration with local and state health departments, conducted a retrospective study on a cohort of children with lab-confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection with the following objectives. To describe the secondary attack rate among household contacts of children with lab-confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection, and to describe risk factors associated with secondary infection among household contacts. Next slide. Throughout the course of the pandemic, reported incidence of SARS-CoV-2 cases in children 17 years or younger in the United States has been lower than that in adults aged 18 years or older. This difference in incidence is likely multifactorial and at least in part due to selective testing and under-recognition of cases and mitigation measures such as rapid implementation of school closures early in the pandemic. Other influencing factors include differences in behavior and exposure risks in adults compared to children. Additionally, children are more likely to have mild or asymptomatic infections, making infection difficult to identify. Measurements of SARS-CoV-2 transmissibility among and from children are complicated by these and other factors. Whilst it is known that children of all ages can transmit the virus, the extent to which children drive transmission remains unclear. Next slide. In July 2020, CDC was notified of a SARS-CoV-2 outbreak that had occurred among children and young people attending a summer camp in the state of Georgia. In collaboration with state and local health departments, CDC retrospectively investigated the camp outbreak. These findings are published in the journal Pediatrics. Along with the outbreak investigation, CDC performed a concurrent retrospective cohort study of secondary household transmission from camp attendees to their household contacts once they returned home. Using a structured questionnaire, we interviewed SARS-CoV-2 positive camp attendees and their household members to collect demographic and clinical characteristics, SARS-CoV-2 testing history, and exposures and behaviors before, during, and after camp. We worked with commercial laboratories to confirm self-reported test results. Next slide. We defined camp attendee cases as those with self-reported laboratory evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection by molecular or antigen testing with symptom onset date restrictions. We defined a household contact as a person who stayed greater than one night in the household during the camp attendee cases infectious period and classified the household contacts as cases or non-cases using the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologist or CSTE probable and confirmed case definitions. We did not distinguish between probable or confirmed cases, meaning household contacts were classified as cases if they met clinical criteria with an epidemiologic linkage with or without confirmatory SARS-CoV-2 testing. The camp attendees infectious period was defined as two days prior to symptom onset date until 10 days after symptom onset date. Next slide. 
270 interviewed camp attendees were identified as cases. We defined the primary case as the camp attendee case with the earliest illness onset date in the household, provided that illness onset was greater than one day prior to the illness onset date of other cases within the same household. If multiple camp attendee cases resided in the same household, they were defined as co-primary cases, regardless of illness onset date. If a household contact had an illness onset date prior to or within one day after the camp attendee case, then we were unable to define the camp attendee as the primary case. Next slide. We excluded camp attendees who were greater than 19 years of age, camp attendees who did not have any participating household contacts with enough information for case classification, and camp attendees who were not identified as primary or co-primary cases in their households. After exclusion, we identified 224 camp attendee cases in 194 households with 526 household contacts. Of note, two primary cases each spent time in two different households during their infectious period. Next slide. The 224 primary cases are described in the left-hand column and had a median age of 14 years. 51% were female, 88% were non-Hispanic white, and 6% reported having one or more underlying medical condition. 82% of the primary cases were symptomatic, none were hospitalized. Their 526 household contacts described in the right-hand column were a median age of 46 years and 50% were female. 80 of the 526 household contacts were not interviewed, but had enough information to be classified as a case or not a case and were included in the analysis. Among the 440, 434 interviewed household contacts, 90% were non-Hispanic white and 14% had at least one underlying medical condition. Next slide. Among 526 household contacts, 48 were identified as secondary cases for a secondary attack rate of 9%. When excluding household contacts who were never tested, the secondary attack rate was 12%. The 48 secondary cases occurred amongst 18% of the households. Among these households, the secondary attack rate was 45%. Of note, the camp attendees returned home with a known exposure, which may have contributed to a lower secondary attack rate among household contacts, as many primary cases physically distanced or wore masks upon returning home. 20% of the primary cases had symptom onset while at camp and may not have been as infectious after returning home. Additionally, secondary cases at ascertainment is limited by the fact that not all household contacts were systematically tested. Next slide. Of note, four of the 41 or 10% of adult secondary cases required hospitalization. Next slide. We also looked at factors that may have increased or decreased the risk for household transmission from children or adolescents. Next slide. In the univariable analysis, parents of primary cases had increased risk of secondary infection compared with siblings of primary cases with an odds ratio of 2.3. Extended family members were also at increased risk with an odds ratio of 6.6. .6. Next slide. Here we have both univariable and multivariable results for all characteristics included in the multivariable model. For the multivariable analysis, we selected key characteristics of primary cases, which included age, presence of COVID-19 symptoms, physical distancing and mask use, and level of contact between the household contact and the primary case. The univariable results are in orange, and the multivariable results are in blue. Next slide. In our investigation, age of the primary case was not found to be associated with transmission risk. In the univariable model, the younger age group of primary cases, age seven to 10 years, had an unadjusted odds ratio of 2.3, but was not statistically significant. In the multivariable model, we see that the directionality of the association flipped, with younger age groups now having adjusted odds ratios of less than one, while still remaining not, not statistically significant. Of note, the proportion of primary cases who reported physically distancing and wearing masks increased with increasing age. This may be contributing to the discordant directions of transmission by risk by age of the primary case between the univariable and multivariable models. Next slide. The symptom status of the primary case, defined as ever symptomatic and asymptomatic, were associated with an unadjusted and adjusted odds ratio of 5.5, but was not significant in either model. Next slide. We also evaluated physical distancing and mask use during the camp attendees infectious period. 
We define physical distancing as attempting to remain six feet apart from household contacts as much as possible and not sharing a sleeping space or bathroom. We define mask use as always wearing a mask around household members. Physical distancing and always using a mask around contacts were both found to be protective in the univariable and multivariable model. However, while the directionality of the association remained true in the multivariable model, mask use was no longer statistically significant. Given the consistent direction of association and the odds ratio of less than one in both models, this may be a reflection of the multivariable model being unable to detect statistical significance due to small secondary case numbers, rather than an indication that mask use was not protected. Next slide. Finally, we also evaluated contact level with the primary case as a transmission risk factor. We created ordinal categories called contact level, describing how closely the household contact interacted with the primary case, with direct contact being the most intimate. Direct contact and close contact with primary cases, compared with minimal or no contact, were both significantly associated with a greater than five-fold increased odds for both models. Next slide. This investigation includes a large cohort of children and adolescents identified as primary cases in their households. We found that children and adolescents transmitted SARS-CoV-2 to other pediatric and adult household contacts. One in five households had secondary transmission, and among those, almost half of the household contacts were infected. Transmission from children to adults resulted in 10% of the adult secondary cases requiring hospitalization, while none of the primary cases required hospitalization. And transmission risk to the household contacts decreased when the primary case physically distanced from household contacts during their infectious period. Next slide. The findings from this investigation stemming from one large outbreak at an overnight camp highlights the importance of implementing effective public health guidelines to prevent SARS-CoV-2 transmission in all settings including settings with children. It should be noted that this study occurred in July 2020, prior to COVID-19 vaccine availability for children or adults, and had children or adults been vaccinated, infection severity and transmission would have been reduced. Following a COVID-19 diagnosis, children and adolescents should remain at home and physically distance from unvaccinated contacts. In areas with active community spread, and particularly in congregate settings, Unvaccinated children and adolescents should wear masks if feasible and maintain social distancing of at least six feet from others to prevent SARS-CoV-2 transmission. Next slide. These are my references. Next slide. I would like to thank the following groups for their assistance with this investigation. Next slide. Anna, thanks so much for that excellent presentation to your large team that supported it. We're now waiting for questions to come in. Please, uh, audience, submit your questions for Anna. All right, Anna, the first question is, how can you differentiate between a close contact and a direct contact? So we asked many questions about specific interactions and then grouped those interactions into ordinal categories. So let me just pull those up. So direct contact was um, if they touched each other, so hugging, kissing, um, or sharing meals. And then close contact was if they interacted within six feet of each other. So if they, uh, yeah, if they knew that they had been within six feet of each other, and I think that also included sharing a vehicle, because a lot of parents picked their kids up from the camp and, and drove them home. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, our next question is, since your secondary case definition included probable and confirmed CSTE definitions, what was the breakdown of the 48 second cases? Did you do a sensitivity analysis restricting your analysis to only confirmed cases? If so, how did your findings change, if at all? So of the confirmed secondary cases, there were only two that were not tested. Um, so there were only two that were probable, that met the probable case definition and the rest met the confirmed case definition. So we didn't perform um, a sensitivity analysis. Thank you. How much time had passed between the camp and the interview of households? How possible, um, how was possible recall bias assessed? 
Yeah, so we interviewed the families about three weeks after the camp. So certainly there could be some recall bias in the in their answers to the survey questions. Well, we're awaiting additional questions to come in. I, I had a question around the practicality or, or your guidance in helping with distancing of, of younger children, thinking about the generalizability of, of this study that took place um, amongst somewhat older children, but um, guidance for how do you distance um, in the home setting a younger children? Do, do you have some suggestions? Yeah, so we decided to use physically distance instead of the strict isolation definition for that reason. So we define physically distancing as attempting to remain six feet apart and not share a sleeping space and not share a bathroom. So we didn't uh, try to use the strict isolation definition. And then for the physically distancing, we found that kids as young as 11 were able to do that uh, about, I think it was about 60% of the time. And then once they were younger than 11, yes, it was very difficult for them to, to stay six feet apart from um, their caregivers. There are specific interactions that carry a higher risk of transmission. So direct contact specifically has a, a higher risk of transmission. So touching, hugging, kissing, sharing, eating utensils. And so I think practically you could encourage parents try not to, to hug and kiss and cuddle while uh, during the infectious period. Yeah, not easy to do, but... Yeah, <laughs> difficult. <laughs> um, the next question is, why did you select the 16 to 19 year age group um, in both your UNA and Monte variant analysis um, as your reference? And then the second question is, how did you define minimal contact? So we were hypothesizing that there would be an increased risk of transmission with the younger age groups and a decreased risk of transmission with the older age groups. So we use the oldest age group as reference and compare the younger age groups to them. And then uh, the second question was how to define minim how did we define minimal contact? So those were um, family members who said that they did not touch each other and they were occasionally within six feet of each other. So we asked people, have you been within six feet of each other some of the time, uh, all of the time, or none of the time? And people who said that they were within six feet of each other some of the time, but they didn't have any uh, physical contact, we defined as minimal interaction. Thank you. Could you comment on how your findings influence CDC recommendations as well as regulations or policies at the state level? Yeah, so the transmission analysis from pediatric cases to adults definitely helps inform the conversation around school reopening, which was <clears throat> at the time of the camp investigation. And then it also helped with camp outbreak guidance specifically. So around the same time as our investigation was going on, there was another one going on in Maine where an outbreak was actually prevented and they followed strict cohorting, physical distancing and mask use in a way that the Georgia camp did not. So uh, the Georgia State Health Department was able to compare our outbreak investigation to the main uh, investigation where there was an outbreak, uh, then where an outbreak did not happen. And we're able to use that for revising their camp recommendations for this, uh, this current summer. The next question is, how did you confirm participants observed physical distancing or mask adherence? Yeah, so that is one of the uh, limitations of the study. We weren't able to confirm uh, that people used masks or uh, distance the way they said they did. When we interviewed families, we did speak to parents and children. Uh, so they helped corroborate each other's um, statements. But for the most part, people seemed pretty truthful. They would tell us, no, I didn't wear a mask at all, or I only wore a mask one day. Um, so 
we 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 felt like people were being pretty honest with how much uh, mask use they and distancing they did. Thanks. The next question is: Did you consider population density? And I imagine that is the the density in, in different uh, camp environments, but I'm I'm not entirely sure. So as part of the outbreak investigation, we did look at number of cabins and number of children in cabins and mapped those out. I think the median number of children per cabin was about 25. And we had transmission in, I think, all but two of the cabins. So the population was fairly dense and there was transmission in nearly the entire uh, population. And those findings are outlined in the camp outbreak investigation in the pediatrics journal. I imagine there was also a lot of congregating in the cafeteria as well. Yeah, they tried to cohort in quadrants and they actually had four separate doors, one for each quadrant. But the problem was before entering the doors, they the, the four quadrants tended to interact with each other for singing and cheering. <laughs> well, it is summer, after all. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, big thanks to all of our presenters. Um, this concludes the oral presentation session. Um, and to all the audience for their great challenging questions. I had a few in there myself. Um, we're going to now segue to our photo session. So for the next 15 minutes, we'll watch some of the photos submitted for our photo contest. Thanks to everyone.
Welcome back, everybody. It's good to have you back. And I'm sure you agree that the previous session was absolutely riveting. It was really enjoyable. So without further ado, I'd like to move on to the photo contest awards. So it's quite heartwarming to acknowledge that we received 73 photos from 19 countries, reflecting an incredible diversity of activities that FETP residents and alumni have conducted over the previous year and more. The FETP International Nights Photo Contest is an annual tradition. This contest gives FETP trainees and graduates the opportunity to convey the impact of their work through compelling photographs taken in the field. A panel of judges from TEFINET and CDC reviews the submissions and selects the first, second, and third place winners. A fourth place winner is determined via a popular vote on the TEFINET Facebook page. And I'm sure over the last 15 minutes, you've really enjoyed looking through the 73 photos that have been funneling on through the system. So without further ado, let's move on uh, to the Facebook winner. Great. And let me just... Uh, I'm unable to pin that screen. I can't see the screen. There we go. Now I've got it. Great. So the Facebook winner is Abdul Shakur Karimi from the Afghanistan FETP. And now the third place winner. Third place goes to Dr. Ehab al sakaf from the Yemen FETP. And moving on to the second place winner. Second place goes to Lilibeth Romero Mendoza from the Colombia FETP. And finally, the first place winner goes to Laja Ndapewa Omagano Ipinge from the Namibia FELTP. It is a pleasure to present the Jeffrey E. Copeland Award for Excellence in Poster Scientific Presentation which honors Dr. Jeffrey Copeland, former director and 26 year veteran of the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for his outstanding contributions to improving public health globally and for his commitment to excellence in scientific research, analysis and presentation. The Copeland Award is presented to the author of the scientific poster that most effectively emphasizes the results of an investigation and its impact on public health. The winning poster for this year's Jeffrey P. Copeland Award is COVID-19 and chronic dialysis patients, one year of the pandemic in Argentina by Dr. Mikaela Gauto. Dr. Gauto's investigation quantified the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on chronic dialysis patients in Argentina and offered control and prevention recommendations with the potential to influence public health policy and services in the country. So a very big congratulations to Dr. Gauto. I'm gonna now turn back to Carl for the next award presentation. Great, thank you, thank you, Kim. <laughs> it's my pleasure now to announce the William H. Fagey Award for Excellence in Oral Scientific Presentation. The William H. Fagey Award for Excellence in Oral Scientific Presentation was established in honor of Dr. William H. Fagey the renowned epidemiologist, Presidential Medal of Freedom recipient, and former director of the US Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, credited with devising the global strategy that led to the eradication of smallpox in the late 1970s. 
The award is the highest FETP International Nights honor presented for the best oral presentation. Dr. Fagi is an Emeritus Presidential Distingu Distinguished Professor of International Health at Emory University and served as CDC Director from 1977 to 1983. Dr. Fagi actually founded the Task Force for Child Survival, later renamed the Task Force for Global Health and served as its executive director from 1984 to 2000. Under Dr. Fagy's leadership, the Task Force for Global Health developed and applied a model of collaboration that resulted in childhood immunization rates in the developing world, increasing from 20 to 80% in just six years. He has also previously served as a senior fellow at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and a director at the Carter Center. And now for the award. So the William H. Fagy Award for Excellence in Oral Scientific Presentation goes to Oliver Mweso for his study called The Prevalence of Suspected SARS-CoV-2 Reinfection Among the Zambian Population, Zambia 2020 to 2021. Congratulations, Oliver, and to the Zambia FELTP. Well done. And now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing two special guests to present the next award. This is a new award, so let me introduce Drs. Sonia Singh and Aaron Kennedy for this first ever presentation of the Sarah Lowther Memorial Award. On behalf of Sarah Lowther's friends and family, we're delighted to honor her public health legacy today. Sarah passed away a year ago and family, friends, and colleagues were all devastated. Sarah grew up in a small town in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and she burst with life and passion and all that <clears throat> She carried the zest for life and discovery throughout her career. Her love of global work first shined in Pakistan working on oral polio vaccination campaigns. For her PhD in infectious disease epidemiology at Johns Hopkins, she worked in Zambia, her thesis on measles and HIV. She served as an EIS officer at the Minnesota Department of Health. Later, she worked in both CDC's Division of Viral Hepatitis and the Global Immunization Division. She was an integral member of CDC's Kenya Country Office serving as program director for polio and immunizations, then as FETP resident advisor. She returned to Atlanta in 2019 as the acting lead of the Epi Technical Support Unit for FETP. Sarah was passionate about FETP as a means to develop and mentor field epidemiologists around the world and build global health field capacity. Infectious disease prevention and training future public health leaders were causes important to her throughout her career. She was a colleague, mentor, sharing her wisdom and scientific curiosity, and above all, a friend to so many. And now Erin will describe the award and announce the winner. Thank you, Sonia. Based on Sarah's public health interests, Sarah's colleagues and friends developed the Sarah Lowther Field Epidemiology Training Program Memorial Fund in collaboration with TEFINET, CDC Foundation, and CDC's FETP program. The Sarah Lowther FETP Memorial Fund supports a yearly award for an FETP fellow or recent graduate to conduct a project that makes significant contributions to infectious disease prevention and control in their country. I am honored to have the privilege to announce the first ever recipient of the Sarah Lowther FETP Memorial Award. The first recipient of this award is Jessica Yoon. Jessica is a resident of the South Africa Field Epidemiology Training Program, and her award-winning proposal is titled Evaluation of the CoughWatch SA Application as a Digital Participatory Surveillance Platform, January to July, 2021. CoughWatch SA is a national online surveillance platform that allows individuals to register and track symptoms that cover a range of respiratory diseases. The project will evaluate the platform's ability to detect and monitor symptomatic acute respiratory illness in South Africa. 
It is exciting to be honoring Sarah by supporting a fellow with similar public health interests as Sarah. The award committee is confident that Jessica has the expertise, knowledge, and leadership skills necessary to successfully carry out the proposed work, as well as to make a significant impact on the health of South Africans throughout her public health career. We wish Jessica well in the execution of this proposal and in all her future public health endeavors. Congratulations, Jessica. It's now a pleasure to introduce the Director's Award for Excellence in Epidemiology and Public Health Response. This award is presented in recognition of significant contributions towards successful responses to public health emergencies, both natural and man-made disasters, disease outbreaks, etc. Nominees can include FETP or FELTP resident advisors who have provided leadership working as part of a response and have been successful in overcoming challenging circumstances. The award is also to recognize excellence in epidemiologic practice or research and contributions that address a public health issue of major importance by applying epidemiologic principles and methods. Nominations can recognize accomplishments that improved human health, that made a substantial reduction in burden of disease, or represented innovations to public health practice based on epidemiologic foundations or implementation of epidemiological approaches. Recognized contributions should be practical, explicit, and applied, rather than theoretical or implicit. And we are we are excited this year to be actually presenting two awards, one for applications made in 2020 and the second award for applications made in 2021. I'd like to hand over to Dr. Kip Baggett now to, to give the award. Thank you, Carl. Um, I have the pleasure of presenting the 2020 Director's Award for Excellence in Epidemiology and Public Health Response to the Pakistan Field Epidemiology Laboratory Training Program. The Pakistan nomination highlighted two very well done and impactful investigations. The first was a response to extensively drug resistant typhoid fever in two of Pakistan's largest cities. The FELTP identified multiple risk factors, strengthened surveillance for typhoid and implemented evidence-based interventions to reduce mor morbidity and mortality. The second was an outbreak of HIV among children where the investigation identified over 900 HIV infections, 86% of which were in children. The Pakistan FELTP designed and conducted a case control study that identified the key risk factor, reuse of IV sets by private practitioners. Their findings led to a series of critical interventions that improved infection control practices and reduced or future morbidity and mortality. Both of these responses were made possible thanks to the FELTP establishing the Provincial Disease Surveillance and Response Units. So again, that was the 2020 Director's Award. And next I'm going to be presenting the 2021 Award. And the 2021 Director's Award for Excellence in Epidemiology and Public Health goes to the Uganda Public Health Fellowship Program for their contributions to the national COVID-19 response. FETP Uganda led over 60 COVID-19 response activities, including studies on household transmission, vaccine hesitancy and effectiveness, cluster investigations, facility preparedness assessments, and border hotspot studies. The Ugandan fellows demonstrated tireless commitment and use of multiple study designs to answer important and time-sensitive questions that directly informed national mitigation plans. So let me offer a huge congratulations to the programs in Pakistan and Uganda for this really great accomplishment. And that concludes our award ceremony, the awards portion of our 2021 International Nights. And I want to close this out with a few congratulations and, and thank yous. So first I, and foremost, I need to congratulate presenters, both the oral presenters 
Um, looks like the, the slides are a little bit ahead of me there, but um, I want to start by congratulating the presenters, the oral presenters and poster presenters. What a truly phenomenal job they did this year, especially uh, given the need to navigate this all virtual environment. And congratulations also to the program directors, program staff, mentors, resident advisors, and the many others who have been instrumental to the successes you have seen highlighted in this year's presentations. And even more noteworthy than these excellent presentations is the impact of the work represented behind the presentations. The outbreaks detected and stopped, the surveillance systems strengthened, the health policies implemented the diseases averted and lives saved. And now I want to congratulate the 2020 International Nights Planning Committee. So if we could get that slide back up to show our wonderful planning committee, thank you. Um, as you can imagine, planning this year's event was especially complex, but this group made it look easy. Um, I had a, a behind the curtain look at things uh, while the International Nights was going on yesterday and today, and truly amazing the way the team worked together. And I do want to highlight the excellent teamwork displayed to make this happen between TEFINAD and CDC and DCE. So a big thank you and congratulations to this group. And finally, I want to give a huge note of thanks to all of you, everyone who joined us online yesterday and today. We had 735 participants, which is truly amazing and certainly would not have been possible without, ex ex without expert technical support and coordination. I want to especially acknowledge all of the FETP residents and fellows joining us from around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic has shined a light on all of you and your FETPs. Your country, your region, and the world need you as we continue our collective response to the pandemic and continually prepare to detect and respond to the next threat. I think this message was very clear in Dr. Walensky's remarks at the beginning of today's event. Thank you for your continued commitment and keep up the good work. Uh, all of participants will be receiving a survey um, after International Nights is concluded. The survey is requesting your feedback on International Nights this year. And it's especially important to get your feedback this year. We want to know what worked well, what could be improved, so we know how we can make things better next year. And although we fully plan for next year's International Nights to be an in-person event, we can certainly learn from this year and may still want to employ some of this year's innovations. So with that, I will bring this year's 2021 FETP International Nights to a close. For the presenters, both the oral presenters and poster presenters, you should have received an email from Amber Ellathorpe directing you to a Zoom link. Uh, so I ask you to please join that Zoom link now for a group photo. And to the rest of you, uh, be well and enjoy the rest of your day.